Hi there, it's Friday the 7th of September 2018. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to the very first edition of International Tax Bites, ITB, my weekly review of the important international tax developments impacting multinationals. Yes, that's right, I'm back from the beach. Here's this week's stories. Cheers. Well, digital taxation is still the world's number one international tax issue. This week at the International Fiscal Association's 2018 Congress in Seoul, digital taxation was discussed in a number of the sessions. In the plenary session for subject number two, which was called Withholding Tax in the Era of BEPs, CIVs and Digital Economy, Valer Moutalier from the European Commission explained that the Commission's proposed digital services tax is not a withholding tax. It's a tax on gross revenue, a turnover tax with no foreign tax credit in the residence country, although it might be allowed as a tax deduction there. Gary Sprague from Baker McKenzie agreed and characterised the digital services tax in this way. The best way to think about the digital services tax is akin to an excise tax, like an excise tax on the extraction of natural resources like oil. One of the comments you hear is that data is the new oil, and the DST seems to me to be closer to an oil extraction tax than one on net income. Well, technically, yes, but we all know that the DST is a surrogate for corporate income tax on net profits. And that's how it should be assessed from a policy perspective, particularly in regard to the rate. For example, the proposed 3% rate implies a deemed source country net profit level of 15% if the source country corporate income tax rate is 20%. If the source country corporate income tax rate is, say, 25%, the deemed source country net profit is 12%. Remember, these are only the source country deemed net profit levels. Other countries would also want their share of the pie. There's some urgency within the EU to reach an agreement on the DST by the end of this year. But there's much more time for the second prong of the Commission's two-prong approach to digital taxation, the proposed long-term solution involving the concept of significant digital presence. Valère Moutalier said this, The timeline is a bit more relaxed, and it is to be seen in the context of the 2020 OECD report, and the final discussion of the EU's Common Consolidated Corporate Tax Base, which we hope will be converging in 2021. The next step for the DST takes place tomorrow. The EU finance ministers are currently enjoying a two-day informal meeting in Vienna. Austria is currently in the presidency position and digital taxation is on the agenda for tomorrow afternoon. There are a number of areas of conflict. Firstly, there are those countries which are supporters of the DST, there are those countries which are opposed, and there are those countries whose position is currently unclear, such as Germany. Another area of conflict is in regard to the rate. Some countries think that 3% is too low. But remember my comments just now about deemed net profit levels in the source country. 
These countries are trying to get agreement that the 3% should be a minimum rate, with individual countries allowed to go higher if they wish. A third area of conflict is in regard to the scope of transactions which will be subject to the DST. Under the current proposal, the DST will be imposed on revenue from online advertising, digital intermediary activities and sale of user data. Some countries want the scope to exclude revenue from the sale of user data. And a fourth area of conflict is in regard to the proposed threshold, which is global annual revenue of 750 million euros and annual EU revenue of 50 million euros. Some countries want these numbers to be reduced so that smaller companies will be caught. It all makes for an interesting discussion tomorrow afternoon over apple strudel. In regard to the long-term solution, comments made by OECD officials at the IFA Congress indicate that some progress is being made, particularly in regard to the entrenched views of the US government on the arm's length principle. Firstly, Pascal saint amand said that the US beat tax, the base erosion and anti-abuse tax, looks like a vote of no confidence in the arm's length principle. He said this, something like an earthquake that people have not really understood is happening. The beat seems to be reflecting a view, at least by US legislators, that there is an issue with the current transfer pricing rules. Is it an issue with the arm's length principle as such, or an issue of the implementability of the current transfer pricing rules? The question is there, and it is going to have a massive impact on the conversation. And David Bradbury indicated that the US has provided some positive ideas in regard to the long-term solution, particularly in regard to the recognition of source country marketing intangibles and other ways to allocate profits to the source country. A couple of weeks ago, the government in Chile announced a major tax reform. More about that later. But for now, I want to focus on the digital tax which was included in the tax reform package. The new digital tax will apply to certain B2C digital services provided by non-residents, such as video games, music or video streaming, and data storage. As you would expect, the intention is that the digital tax would not be covered by Chile's double tax treaties. This proposal is interesting for two reasons. Firstly, the tax rate, which will be 10% applied to the gross service fee. Now, you might think that, having regard to my previous comments, a 10% tax rate would be a very high rate as a surrogate for corporate income tax on net profits. Well, there's a big difference here compared to the EU. The EU member countries impose VAT on inbound B2C digital services. That being the case, the proposed EU DST can correctly be viewed as a surrogate for corporate income tax on net profits. But in Chile, inbound B2C digital services are generally not subject to VAT, which has a standard rate of 19% in Chile. So the proposed 10% digital tax can be seen as a surrogate for both corporate income tax on net profits and the 19% VAT. And in that light, you might argue that the 10% rate looks on the low side. 
The second interesting aspect is the collection mechanism. The tax will be collected by the credit card companies and other payment processors, acting as unpaid withholding agents. That's a mechanism which has been used elsewhere in South America in regard to VAT on inbound services. The OECD has published the latest batch of Stage 1 peer review reports in regard to BEPS Action 14, which concerns dispute resolution. In this latest batch, eight countries are reviewed. Australia, Ireland, Israel, Japan, Malta, Mexico, New Zealand and Portugal. If you're interested in the MAP performance of any of these countries, the report for that country is well worth reading. There's lots of information. But let me focus on the statistics for the average time it takes for an MAP case to be closed in each of these countries. That's where the rubber hits the road. Remember, the BEPS Action 14 target is 24 months. And I should say that the numbers relate to the MAP cases which were closed during the two-year period from the 1st of January 2016 to the 31st of December 2017. So let's start with Australia. As usual, the figures are split into two groups. Attribution allocation cases which refer to PE profit attribution cases under Article 7 and transfer pricing cases under Article 9 and other cases. As you can see, Australia's numbers are well under the 24 months target. Now to Ireland, which is under the target in regard to all cases, but almost three months over the target for attribution allocation cases. Israel is well over the target on all three measures. More resources are probably needed. Japan is well under the target for the other cases, but it's about three and a half months over the target for attribution allocation cases. With Malta, there are no numbers. There were no MAP cases which closed during the relevant two-year period. On all three measures, Mexico is close, but no cigar. New Zealand is well under the target for all three measures, and it wins the prize for the best set of numbers in this fourth batch. And Portugal does well in regard to other cases, but it goes through the roof in regard to attribution allocation cases. Not surprisingly, the report notes that Portugal needs additional MAP resources, particularly in regard to transfer pricing. There's a separate report for each of the eight countries. Each report is about 80 pages. As I said, there's lots of information. If you want to have a look at the reports, please go to our website or app. The OECD has published the third edition of its tax reforms report. This report describes the latest tax reforms in all of the 35 OECD member countries, as well as Argentina, Indonesia and South Africa. The report identifies a number of common themes. For example, there's been a significant reduction in corporate income tax rates so far in this century. The average corporate income tax rate amongst the OECD member countries was 32.5% in 2000. It's now 23.9%. Pascal Santaman said this about tax rates. 
among the countries that introduced significant corporate tax reforms in the last year were a number with high corporate tax rates, where tax reform was long overdue. While these corporate tax cuts have created some concerns of a race to the bottom, most of these countries appear to be engaged in a race to the average, with their recent corporate tax rate cuts now placing them in the middle of the pack. Another important theme is that, with the exception of South Africa, none of the countries increased their standard VAT rate in 2018. After many years of VAT rate increases since the financial crisis, perhaps the ceiling has now been reached. If you would like to obtain a copy of the report, it's 127 pages, you can do so at our website or app. And now for the developments in Asia Pacific. In China, the government has announced a number of tax cuts with the express intention of boosting the real economy. Commentators have stated that these changes are likely in response to the increased US tariffs. The most significant of the changes relates to interest income derived by foreign institutions in the onshore bond market. This income will be exempt from both corporate income tax and VAT for three years. Other changes include an expansion of the existing VAT exemption for interest income on loans to small and micro enterprises. The expansion involves a doubling of the size of credit lines to which the exemption applies. And also in China, the SAT has issued Notice 46 in regard to tax depreciation claims on machinery and equipment. For new machinery and equipment acquired from the 1st of January 2018 to the 31st of December 2020, the company can choose a 100% depreciation in the first year. This new rule applies to machinery and equipment with a value of less than 750,000 US dollars. For a copy of Notice 46, please go to our website or app. In India, the government has extended the deadline for public comments on the Significant Economic Presence Test, which expands the domestic tax law concept of business connection, and which was introduced in this year's tax law amendments. The original deadline was the 31st of August. That's now been extended to the 30th of September. The government is looking for public comments on the appropriate thresholds which should be used for the new test in regard to both physical and digital goods and services. For information on this public consultation, please go to our website or app. In Malaysia, the new, or is it the old, SST, the Sales and Service Tax, has replaced the GST, the Goods and Services Tax, effective the 1st of September 2018. There was an SST for many years in Malaysia, up to 2015, when it was replaced by the GST. The GST was very unpopular, and the new government made an election promise to repeal it. There are a number of major differences between the new SST and GST. Firstly, the scope of taxable transactions is narrower with the SST. And secondly, SST is a single stage tax. It's not a VAT like the now repealed GST. 
The SST has two components, the sales tax and the service tax. The sales tax is imposed on imported and locally manufactured goods. The tax is levied either at the time of import or at the time the goods are sold or otherwise disposed of by the manufacturer. The tax rate is generally 10% applied to the sales value of the goods. However, a lower 5% rate will apply to a range of goods listed in a schedule. For example, prefabricated buildings and food products. The service tax is imposed on taxable services provided in Malaysia. It does not apply to imported services. The tax rate is generally 6%. And in New Zealand, the tax authorities have released for public comment draft guidance in regard to the BEPS legislation which was enacted earlier this year. For a copy of the draft guidance, there's 177 pages. Please go to our website or app. And now for the developments in Europe. Let's start with EU state aid and tax rulings. The European Commission has released the non-confidential version of its 20th of June decision in regard to the Luxembourg rulings given to companies in the NG Group. You'll remember that the rulings relate to a hybrid convertible loan structure between Luxembourg companies in the group with an asymmetrical Luxembourg tax treatment, debt on one side, equity on the other. The Commission concluded that the rulings constituted illegal state aid. Last week, the Luxembourg government announced that it plans to appeal the decision to the EU courts. For a copy of the non-confidential version of the decision, it's 86 pages, please go to our website or app. France is all set to join the rest of the EU and most developed countries globally in requiring employers to deduct tax from employee salaries. For many years, France has been an exception in not requiring tax to be withheld from payrolls. Well, after a few wobbles in the last week or so, the government has now confirmed that the new system will start as scheduled on the 1st of January 2019. In Ireland, the government has released a document called Corporation Tax Roadmap. The roadmap sets out the government's plan to implement the two EU anti-tax avoidance directives and the recommendations of the coffee review. Here are the interesting points I noted. In regard to CFC rules, which will be implemented effective from the 1st of January 2019, the government has decided to go with option B, which limits the CFC rules to non-genuine arrangements which have been put in place for the essential purpose of obtaining a tax advantage. In regard to the general anti-abuse rule, the government's view is that no action is required due to the strength of Ireland's existing GAR. In regard to transfer pricing, Ireland's existing rules will be updated, effective from the 1st of January 2020, to ensure alignment with the 2017 OECD transfer pricing guidelines. There will be a public consultation in regard to the various transfer pricing issues identified in the Coffee Review Report including, most importantly, the status of the existing grandfathering rule. And there will be a public consultation 
in regard to the issue of whether Ireland should move to a territorial regime. For a copy of the Corporation Tax Roadmap, please go to our website or app. In the Netherlands, the government has launched an online public consultation on the Dutch tax ruling practice. For the link to the consultation website, please go to our website or app. In Poland, the government has released draft legislation in regard to a number of topics. Let me go through the items that caught my eye. Firstly, draft legislation for the proposed innovation box regime. The regime has been designed to be compliant with the Nexus approach in BEPS Action 5. The tax incentive rate will be 5%. The second big topic is the proposed introduction of anti-avoidance rules in regard to withholding tax reductions or exemptions under treaties or domestic law which implements EU directives. The rules will apply to withholding tax on dividends, interest, royalties and service fees. Under the rules, there will be a new domestic law definition of beneficial owner, which will introduce a requirement that the non-resident taxpayer is carrying out real business activity. In the situation where the payments of dividends, interest, royalties and service fees to a non-resident taxpayer exceed 2 million Polish zloty per annum, the general rule will be that the payer must withhold tax at the full domestic law rate and remit it to the tax authorities. The non-resident taxpayer would then need to apply for a refund in order to secure the benefit of a treaty or EU directive. There are two exceptions to this general rule, where the payer makes a statement that all of the conditions have been fulfilled and where a favourable opinion has been issued by the tax authorities. The government is also proposing to implement the exit tax effective from the 1st of January 2019, which is one year earlier than required by the EU's ATAD-1. And now to Africa. In Kenya, everyone's complaining about the increase in the prices of motor vehicle fuel and other petroleum products due to the imposition of 16% VAT on petroleum products effective on the 1st of September. The VAT exemption of petroleum products expired on the 31st of August. Parliament passed a bill last week to extend the exemption. However, the President has not yet signed the bill into law. He has two weeks to either approve or reject the bill. So, effective from last Saturday, the tax has been imposed. There are reports this week that many Kenyans are refuelling in Uganda. And the latest development in this story is that the High Court has granted a temporary order stopping the levying of 16% VAT on petroleum products. And in Nigeria, the government has released the new transfer pricing regulations, which are effective for basis periods commencing after the 12th of March 2018. The new regulations are substantially aligned with the 2017 OECD transfer pricing guidelines. As a good example, there's a provision which says that a capital-rich, low-function company is entitled only to the risk-free rate of return on its funding. 
A capital rich, low function company is defined to mean a company that is capitalized with a relatively high amount of equity or equity equivalent capital, but which has limited capacity to carry out risk management functions. Within multinational groups, such companies may, for example, provide funding to associated enterprises or fund research and development programs carried out by associated enterprises. But not all of the provisions are inspired by the OECD. For example, there's a cap on the deduction for intangible royalties paid to related parties. The cap is set at 5% of EBITDA derived from the payer's commercial activity in which the relevant intangible is exploited. And now to the Middle East and Central Asia. In Kyrgyzstan, the government is proposing a simplification of the sales tax rates, which will result in a clear advantage for transactions which are settled in non-cash form. The sales tax rate will be 0% for non-cash transactions, such as by the use of credit cards, and 5% for cash transactions. The rate differential is designed to reduce the black economy. Now to be clear, these changes only apply to sales tax. The VAT rate of 12% is unaffected. And now for the developments in the Americas. Let's start in Argentina, where the economic situation has deteriorated rapidly this year. There's been a 50% reduction in the value of the peso against the US dollar in 2018. And last week, the government asked the IMF to accelerate previously agreed funding. And the country's benchmark interest rate was increased by one third, from 45% to 60% per annum. To protect its revenue base, the government announced this week that export taxes would be increased by four pesos per US dollar for primary goods, such as farming and mining products, and by three pesos per US dollar for other goods. Now, you might think that if you're in an economic crisis, Increasing taxes on exports is counterintuitive. The government agrees, but a peso is a peso. President Macri said this, We know that this is a bad tax, a very bad tax, that goes against that which we want to encourage, which is more exports to generate more quality jobs in every corner of Argentina. But I have to ask exporters to understand that this is an emergency and we need their support. In Canada, the tax court has shown the limitations of Canada's GAR when it comes to treaty shopping. In a case called Alta Energy, the court has held that a Luxembourg company is exempt from Canadian tax on a profit derived on the sale of shares in a land-rich Canadian company under Article 13 of the Luxembourg-Canada Treaty, despite the fact that the use of the Luxembourg company in the structure was specifically to obtain that treaty benefit. Article 13 of the treaty has no treaty-based anti-avoidance provision. And of course, this case was decided in a pre-MLI context. And so the Canadian tax authorities argued unsuccessfully for Canada's domestic law GAR to apply. For a copy of this case, 
please go to our website or app. The big tax news in Chile is still the tax reform package which was proposed by the government on the 23rd of August. From the perspective of multinationals, there are a number of interesting items in the bill. I've already mentioned the digital tax. Here are the others that caught my eye. There will be a single 100% integrated corporate tax system instead of the two models which currently operate. This will mean that all non-resident shareholders, whether resident in treaty countries or not, will incur an effective Chilean tax rate of 35% on distributed profits. Although this would be no change for shareholders resident in treaty countries, it would be a significant reduction for shareholders which are resident in non-treaty countries. The US, of course, is exceptional. Even though the signed US-Chile treaty has not yet been ratified, US shareholders are currently protected by a transitional rule until the 31st of December 2021. Tax deductions will be easier for a number of reasons. Firstly, the basic condition, which currently uses a necessity standard, will be relaxed to a directly or indirectly connected test. The 4% royalty deduction cap will be removed. The existing thin cap rules will be relaxed in regard to project finance and accelerated tax depreciation will be introduced. A number of commentators have made the point that President Piñera does not control either house in Chile's Congress and that therefore this reform package might have a rocky road to travel. We shall see. In Ecuador, the corporate income tax rate has been increased from 22% to a general rate of 25%. However, the rate is 28% if the company fails to provide details of its ownership structure or if it's owned by a tax haven entity, but the ultimate beneficial owner is an Ecuadorian resident. In the US, the OMB, the White House's Office of Management and Budget, has completed its review of the proposed regulations withdrawing the Section 385 Debt Equity Documentation Rules. Commentators are expecting the public release of the proposed regs soon. And in regard to the NAFTA renegotiation, it looks like an agreement has been reached between the US and Mexico. Formal signing will happen in 90 days from the 31st of August. But we're still waiting to see whether Canada will join the party. And finally, Venezuela, which is suffering from enormous economic problems, including hyperinflation. According to The Economist, Venezuela has the world's worst performing economy among countries not at war. GDP fell by more than a third between 2013 and 2017. Inflation could pass a million percent this year, says the IMF. The latest government initiative to help deal with this situation involves the advancement of the payment of tax by large taxpayers. For the next four months, large taxpayers will be required to make both income tax advance payments and VAT advance payments on a daily basis but only business days. And now for this week's treaty developments. We've had two treaties signed, one protocol signed, three treaties enter into force, and one protocol enter into force.
Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 7th of September, 2018. I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend. Cheers. Beautiful. Never say never again.